welcome brave souls to a journey of spine-chilling tales. Before we begin, I urge you to don your headphones and surrender to the darkness. Prepare to immerse yourself in chilling tales that will send shivers down your spine. So, dim the lights, put on your headphones, and allow yourself to be enveloped in the chilling embrace of our horror stories. In East Tennessee, tucked away deep in the shadows of the looming Great Smoky portion of the Appalachian Mountains, lives the tiny, sleepy, all but forgotten town of Coldwater Springs. Once a promising tourist destination, the town enjoyed a couple of decades of success. Given its attractive geography and proximity to growing areas like Johnson City and Knoxville, However, old money and new highways push southbound to places like Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge, leaving behind the not as accessible Coldwater Springs. Essentially, overnight, it became a ghost town, an empty mountain hollow, no different than the countless others that crawled out hundreds of miles in all directions. However, found this place to be the ideal destination for my yearly solo getaway. As a single man in my late 20s with highly introverted needs, renting a cabin in a place like Coldwater Springs and getting out of sight for a few days seemed like the perfect way to de-stress and realign myself. So after saving up my allotted time off and tapping into my vacation account, I made the four-hour trip from my place in Nashville to the foothills and ultimately monstrous mountains of East Tennessee, leaving early enough to get there before sunset. I had found a cabin for an absolute steal a few miles outside of cold water. Blasting my classic country road trip playlist, I was finally relaxed, essentially floating on the voice of Lefty Frizzell as I turned off a long, lonely highway onto a not as long, but twice as lonely, gravel road. Now this is more like it, I said to myself. Although the sun was still high, shadows poured over the mountaintops and onto everything within my view as the gravel road snuck in between the earthly behemoths. For at least two miles, I didn't come across one house or even power lines. I began to wonder if I had turned onto the correct county road and the smaller voice within me questioned whether or not I was being led out here to become another mysterious Appalachian statistic. I laughed it off, given that the blue line of my GPS still shot out in front of me and seemed to be nearing its end. You're here to chill, buddy. Just enjoy yourself, I whispered to my rearview reflection. Finally, I saw electric lights and three mailboxes as I reached the end of the gravel road. I recognized the address of my cabin, the center and furthest residence. I looked around at my temporary neighbors. To my right, darkness and no signs of any human activity. I read from my host online that two of the three cabins were year-round rentals and the other was owned by a sweet elderly widow that loved to help out vacationers and was even well known for sharing from her huge garden. Looking over toward her home, I could see porch lights up higher on the mountain, a few hundred feet. Pleased with the truthfulness of the online listing, I began down my rented driveway. About a quarter mile uphill, I was greeted by my own set of porch lights shining from a beautiful little cabin. A green roof painted dark brown logs and electricity. Ah, my needs were simple but very important. Although the late afternoon shadows covered most of my vista, 
I could already tell that the place was even more beautiful than the pictures suggested. I parked, grabbed my bags, and walked up the porch steps and through the front door. It was a one-bed, one-bath dream house. The smell of pine washed over me, and the lodge decor stole my heart. A deerskin lamp had already been turned on, splashing warm light over the interior. On my right was my bed, with wooden frame and a stitched quilt covered in brown bears. On my left was a kitchen area, and I saw several Appalachian cookbooks on the counter. I would have to check those out for sure. The walls were covered in game and fish trophies of all kinds, from elk to largemouth bass. There was no TV and no Wi-Fi, which was fine with me. I had brought a short stack of novels that I planned on picking clean during my week-long stay. Having unpacked and settled in, I strolled out the front door and onto the string-lit porch. The night was cool and growing ever dark. The white noise of the deep forest was rich, with a chorus of nocturnal creatures singing out full-voiced, celebrating another evening of life. I looked across the hollow and could clearly see the home of my neighbor, well lit against the shadows of the heights. Much to my surprise, she was standing on her porch, looking over at me. I couldn't make out many of her features given the backlighting, save for her silhouette, with white hair visible and sitting like a crown on her small, dark frame. She stood as still as the pines that made up her home. With exaggerated movement, I gave her a big wave with my right arm, letting her know I was supposed to be here, just another tenant in search of few beautiful days of escapism in her neck of the woods. She didn't return the gesture, however, staying perfectly still there on the corner of her dimly lit porch. Maybe she can't see me, I thought to myself. I felt the need to at least call my host and try to get a number for her house so that I could let her know who I am and why I'm there. Luckily, there was a landline phone at my cabin and I had the man's number saved. He answered after a couple of rings and I let him know I, that I had arrived safely and was very pleased with the place and told him I saw the neighbor and would like to call her and at least audibly introduce myself. Oh, you saw Mrs. Klein, he said. That's good to hear. Haven't heard from her in a few weeks and was starting to worry. I haven't had any other renters in a while and haven't made my way there either in a hot minute. He gave me her number and I once again thanked him and we ended our conversation. I dialed her up and held the phone to my ear as I walked back out onto the porch, waiting for my call to be answered. Looking back over toward her house, though, I was almost shocked to see that all of the lights had gone dark. I couldn't see a thing, much less any signs of a wakeful human. The phone rang, and rang to no avail, and to no voicemail. Must have gone to bed. I whispered to myself. Having not thought too much of it, I returned my attention to further settling in and enjoying my evening. Within 10 minutes, I was posted in a comfortable chair on the porch in the cool night air, already several pages into a mystery novel and several sips into a glass of Cabernet. Yes, this was just what my tired soul longed for. I was finally giving myself what I had needed for months. My senses were all satisfied, and the comforting music of the woods at night really wrapped it all together with a bow. After a while, I found my eyes growing heavy from a long day of traveling, and I leaned my head back in a moment of blissful surrender. I jolted awake after what could have been a couple of minutes or several hours. Something was wrong. Something seemed off. In my disorientation, I finally realized 
that the peaceful sounds that had rocked me to sleep were all gone. The woods around me were dead silent. It was like the night had quickly drawn and held its breath. I instinctively held mine, too, as to let my hearing sharpen, given the strange and sudden situation. I sat there for several minutes, book still in hand, completely still and quiet, anxiously needing an answer for this strange muting of nature. Suddenly, from a couple hundred feet down in the dark hollow below, I heard movement. The brush rustled, sharply cutting through the silence. Birds scattered from the tops of trees above the noise. From my point of view, it seemed to be moving left to right, coming no closer, but going no further from me. I was laser focused, trying to get a blind read on what the hell it could be. Suddenly, the rustling stopped. I remained frozen in my chair, unblinking, staring out into the night. As my eyes got used to the dark, I was finally able to make out a large shape down where the noises were coming from. Although distinct features were lost in my poor vision, I saw the outline of a huge animal. It towered above the brush, maybe ten feet tall and several feet wide. It was only barely moving, slightly swaying. Whatever it was, it knew I was there. After another few moments of silence, the large shadow sunk down to the forest floor and rattled further down the hollow away from me. Although possibly delirious, I could have sworn I heard a whistle. A low, slow, human-like whistle. The animal kept moving away until finally it was out of earshot. A couple minutes later, the night resumed its orchestra and all the insects and frogs began to sing again, the mysterious danger having left. After a long moment of relief, yet disbelief, I finally gathered the courage to slowly stand up and creep my way through the door and back into the cabin. I locked the door behind me, breathing heavily. I walked over to the window, my mind racing. What was that thing? My first thought was a bear. This is black bear country after all. Yeah, that had to have been it. Black bears usually aren't much of a threat to those of us who aren't unsealed garbage cans. Yeah, that's what it was. Easily explainable. I kept reassuring myself. Although in the back of my mind, I knew that what I saw was way larger than your run-of-the-mill black bear. I reminded myself that my eyesight was skewed, making shadows stretch and making objects appear bigger than they actually are. I began to calm down as logic seeped into my anxious mind like strong medicine. Okay, okay, we're good, we're fine, I told myself out loud. I made sure the door was locked tight and that all the windows were shut snugly. I kept the porch lights on and lit a candle by my bedside, further comforting me and reminding me where I am and why I'm here in the first place. I sat on my bed, book in hand, ready to resume my reading. Before I began, I scanned the inside of the cabin once more and glanced outside. Looking to my right through the kitchen window, I noticed a dim light across the hollow. Once again, coming from the neighbor's house, whom I now know to be owned by one Mrs. Klein. I stood up and walked across the room, putting my hands on the window pane and leaning over the sink to get a better view. My skin began to crawl, and I felt my heartbeat accelerating. The light was not from the porch this time, but from inside the house. From a wide window, I could see the dark, unmoving outline of the elderly woman facing toward me. She had turned on a lamp and just seemed to be staring toward my cabin. I still couldn't distinguish many features about her, but under her snowy hair I could see her eyes flown wide open as if out of pure terror. They were almost glowing. This startled me to say the least, 
as my own eyes widened out of fearful instinct. After not even ten seconds of this long distance staring contest, the old lady's lamp was extinguished and her cabin was once again drowned in total darkness. I blinked hard several times and backed off the sink. Seeing curtains on the window's edge, I pulled them tight, cursing myself for not noticing them earlier. I did the same to every other window in my cabin. I went back and sat on my bed, bewildered and tired. What a strange night. No, it's all good. Everything is explainable, I reassured myself. Tomorrow, I'll go introduce myself to her and probably love her instantly. This will be great. And that animal was probably just a little black bear. Just gotta keep my powder dry and make sure there's no trash left out. Feeling a little better after my own pep talk and thinking realistically, I was finally able to unwind into the world of my book and ultimately into the world of dreams. I slept through the night and woke up around 9 a.m. when the beams of morning finally found their way down the mountainside to the hollow. I stretched and yawned, feeling refreshed after a surprisingly good night's rest. The night before felt like a weird dream, but in the light of day, it all seemed a lot less scary and strange. I was excited even. Today, I would spend some time exploring the land around my cabin. It sat on dozens of acres, with trails and ponds and creeks all around. Before that, however, I would go meet Mrs. Klein and hopefully develop a good rapport and maybe even a lifelong friend. I also needed some groceries and other items from town and I was looking forward to seeing Coldwater Springs in all of its overlooked glory. Yes, the day was planned. I started a pot of coffee and took a shower. After I was cleaned off, I got dressed, caffeinated, and was out the door. I cranked the car and began heading down my driveway and over to Mrs. Klein's place. I parked by her mailbox and started walking the long driveway uphill. I didn't see a car, but I saw a closed, separate garage, so I assumed it was in there. Her cabin was very similar to mine, maybe a little bigger. The porch was definitely bigger, with large rock steps leading to it from her gravel driveway. On the left side of her house was her apparently ever-popular garden. It really was huge. However, upon nearing it, I noticed that the vegetables looked anything but healthy. Weeds had all but overtaken the entire thing. As if I could do any better, I thought to myself, not wanting to judge. I made my way across the rock steps and up onto her porch. A large stack of letters and packages were strewn around on her doormat, which displayed in large text the words, you made it. My brow raised after seeing all the unopened mail so haphazardly left all about. Oh well, I was just there to shake hands and explain myself. I knocked three times on the front door. I waited, listening for any stirring whatsoever. After about twenty seconds of silence, I knocked again, this time a little louder. Ouch! It hurt my knuckles to knock hard on her door. That was odd, given everything was made out of pine. It had no give, though, and was hard as stone. It wasn't until I noticed the slim windows on each side of the door that I realized why it was so firm. Two X4 boards lined up over the door from the inside, completely sealing it shut. What? The... I said aloud jostling the locked doorknob. I walked over to the wide window to the right of the door, the one I had seen her looking out of just hours before. No, I whispered. It was completely boarded up as well, with not even a centimeter of space to peer inside. This could not be real. I parked by her mailbox and started walking the long driveway uphill. 
I didn't see a car, but I saw a closed, separate garage, so I assumed it was in there. Her cabin was very similar to mine, maybe a little bigger. The porch was definitely bigger, with large rock steps leading to it from her gravel driveway. On the left side of her house was her apparently ever-popular garden. It really was huge. However, upon nearing it, I noticed that the vegetables looked anything but healthy. Weeds had all but overtaken the entire thing. As if I could do any better, I thought to myself, not wanting to judge. I made my way across the rock steps and up onto her porch. A large stack of letters and packages were strewn around on her doormat, which displayed in large text the words, You made it! My brow raised after seeing all the unopened mail so haphazardly left all about. Oh well, I was just there to shake hands and explain myself. I knocked three times on the front door. I waited, listening for any stirring whatsoever. After about twenty seconds of silence, I knocked again, this time a little louder. Ouch! It hurt my knuckles to knock hard on her door. That was odd, given everything was made out of pine. It had no give, though, and was hard as stone. It wasn't until I noticed the slim windows on each side of the door that I realized why it was so firm. Two X4 boards lined up over the door from the inside, completely sealing it shut. What? The... I said aloud, jostling the locked doorknob. I walked over to the wide window to the right of the door, the one I had seen her looking out of just hours before. No, I whispered. It was completely boarded up as well, with not even a centimeter of space to peer inside. This could not be real. I laughed politely and told her I was from Nashville and was staying a few days out in a cabin off of Highway 67, about 20 miles north. Oh my, you're really out of your way, huh? She replied, her eyes narrowing. She paused for a brief moment, glancing down quickly and then back up. Well, I hope you enjoy your stay. You know, out there where you are, they call those the Singing Mountains. Slightly taken aback by her reaction to where I was staying, I asked why they call them by that name. It's because when the wind rolls through those hollers, it sounds like a choir singing, she said, with an intermittently silver-toothed smile that I hadn't noticed before. I returned a smile at the explanation, satisfied. I asked her if there was anywhere to get a bite to eat in the area, as I was starving and didn't plan on being home for a little while longer. Oh yeah, you're going to want to try the Cold Water Duck Inn just down the road. Best burger and catfish in town, she answered as she finished ringing me up. That sounded really good, so I thanked her and grabbed my bags and walked back out to my car. I had a little cellular signal, so I plugged in the restaurant on my GPS and away I went. Not even ten minutes down the road past the town square, I pulled up onto a humble little dive that sure enough had the name Cold Water Duck Inn. A little shack of a place, it had plenty of cars and motorcycles parked out front, and neon signs boasted about having the best burgers and coldest beer in town. This worked for me. I walked through the front door and into a quaint little bar and grill, complete with pool tables and televisions and even an old-school cigarette vending machine. There were several groups in there already enjoying their fares. I got a few looks as I cozied up to the bar shyly. I'm sure they weren't used to seeing new faces around here. Hey, friend, what can I get you started with? A forty-something man with dark hair and tired eyes asked me. After glancing at the menu for a second, I asked him for a light draft beer and a regular cheeseburger with fries. Good choice. You'll love it. 
Where are you in from? Don't think I've seen your face before? I told him my story and where I was staying, laughing as I told him how the lady at the grocery store referred to the area as the Singing Mountains. His face fell. Singing Mountains, huh? A slight hush fell over a couple tables who were close enough to hear our conversation. How's it been out there? He asked. The reaction of the man and the people around us made me nervous, but I answered and told him it was beautiful and peaceful, although I had to mention the animal situation from the night before. I asked him if there were a lot of black bears over in that area. He leaned in close and his voice got real deep and soft. There's a lot more than bears out there in those woods, son, he told me sternly and absolutely before leaning back up and walking away to the kitchen. After an anxious few minutes nursing my beer, he returned with my burger, which looked amazing. I thanked him and dug in, cleaning my plate in less than half an inning of a college baseball game that was on the bar television. I stood up to pay him, but he refused. On me, son. But if I can offer you a word of advice, I'd keep inside after sunset over where you are. It'd be dangerous. Now come back and see us. He told me before giving me a small grin and a quick head nod. I thanked him, way too anxious to ask why it would be that I would want to stay indoors at night over where I was staying. I was also way too scared to ask about the whistling I heard from the unidentified beast in the forest, which I had forgot to mention. I got back in my car and spent the early afternoon driving around the area. I stopped and walked a trail at a local state park and saw a waterfall and took tons of pictures. It was truly paradise. I felt so far removed from my daily troubles back in the city. And I even began to forget the strange warnings the man at the restaurant had given me and the odd goings on of the place I was staying. I wanted to get back with enough daylight to explore the land around my cabin. So I ended up back past the town square and onto the northbound highway toward the Singing Mountains. Once again, I was lost in the heart of true country music as I got back onto the gravel road. Fields flew by me as I made my way back near the end of the drive. I kept smiling and breathing deeply until I finally noticed there was a commotion coming from way up ahead where the road ended. There was a sheriff's truck, two police cars, and a white unmarked SUV parked outside of Mrs. Klein's house. The SUV was pulling out of her driveway and rolled down the road passing me. The men driving had gaunt faces and shot me a hardened look as they went by. What was going? On, I continued past them and rolled to a stop by Mrs. Klein's mailbox. A man in a tan uniform was on her porch, talking to a couple of officers. I assumed him to be the sheriff in question. Next to them was the front door, gaping, having been breached with force. I clenched my jaw at the sight. The sheriff noticed me and shot looks at the officers before returning his gaze my way. Alone, he walked down the porch stairs and into his truck, which then backed down the steep driveway over to me. He got out and walked toward my window, which I rolled down with haste. Afternoon. You the fella staying over at Jeff's place? He asked. In my poor memory, I hadn't even registered that my host's name was Jeff. So I stared at the sheriff in a moment of confusion before answering yes. Well, he called me to come visit Mrs. Klein on your behalf, I believe. Is this right? I nodded. Well, I've since called him back as well, he continued. But I figure you should know, too, since you're the reason I'm out here in the first place. He paused with a big breath. Mrs. Klein has sadly passed. Now I don't suspect any foul play, 
so I don't need anything from you, but thought you should know. I was shocked. He could read it all over my face. I didn't know what to say. Finally, I found the energy to ask him what happened and to ask him about all the boards. Not entirely sure, son. Mrs. Klein was a tender-hearted woman. She never caused any trouble, and she was always sweet and helpful to Jeff and his visitors. However, he paused again with another breath. She would sometimes act a little off, would rant to Jeff and myself and others about conspiracy bull and strange creatures and whatnot. Just her age, I reckon. Must have had an episode boarded herself in so she'd be safe from all her delusions or whatever, and, well, forgot to make a way out. I told him that she was acting strange the night before, staring out her window at me and not answering her phone. I told him she must have boarded it all up in the early hours of the morning. He lowered his brow and looked at me like I had just spoken some alien language. Son... The coroner just drove off with the body, and he says she's been dead for weeks, maybe even a couple of months. He paused. Now I don't know what you're smoking over there, but I know Jeff wouldn't allow it, and I sure as hell don't allow it. So get on, keep your nose clean, and we'll be in touch if we need anything else, he told me, tapping the top of my car and cursing under his breath. I drove slowly on past them and over to my driveway and up the hill, not even remotely registering what I had just been told. Blankly staring through my windshield, I fumbled for my keys and opened the door, using muscle memory to get out and walk up the stairs and into my cabin, where I more or less collapsed onto the bed. That simply had to be wrong. She had to have been alive last night. I know what I saw, right? I wasn't sure anymore. I sprang back up and rushed to the phone. I dialed Jeff, but got no answer. I tried again, nothing. I couldn't be in there anymore, not where I could look out the window. And in my mind's, I see the dark figure standing, watching me in the low light from across the hollow. There was still enough daylight for a good exploration. So I took off down the stairs and behind the cabin. I saw two trailheads at the edge of the backyard. I took the one on the right just to prevent ending up anywhere near Mrs. Klein's property. I really needed to clear my head, so I took a deep breath and made my way down the well-kept trail. All of nature was calm as I walked and walked eventually getting completely out of sight of my cabin. I passed a couple of small ponds that were fed by the trickles of a brook that I had to carefully cross as to avoid getting my shoes wet. The trail hugged the mountainside and soon I was heading upward, the views growing more and more idyllic. I gave myself an hour to walk the trail out so I could return home with ample sunlight. I eventually came to a stop in a small clearing on the trail that had a seriously breathtaking view of the valleys below. From where I was, I could see Coldwater Springs, and way on out, I could see other small towns, peppering the eternal green waves of the Appalachians. It was then that a mighty wind began to rush upward from the fields below, passing through the trees and making beautiful noise. The tones coming from the lowest points of the forest to the highest treetops truly made a choir-like sound. Wow, I said aloud. It really was as if the mountains were singing. It was gorgeous to witness. I sat down and took it all in with my eyes closed for a brief moment, forgetting about all of the strange things that were distracting me from a relaxing vacation. You idiot, I reminded myself. I should be thinking of the sweet widow who had passed, not my own selfish feelings. I felt so bad for her, 
and I hadn't even met her properly, but still, any respects that I could rightfully give her in my mind were tarnished by the unexplainable fact that I saw her the night before and was told an hour ago that she had been dead for weeks or months. I troubled on this as I continued to look out over the pristine landscape. The wind stopped, and with it the wonderful music, at least at first. After a moment, from deep down in the valley, I heard another sound. It was similar to the wind song before, but sounded lower in pitch, like a chorus of low whistles. It also wasn't nearly as pleasing to the ears. In fact, it sounded like the bleeding horn of a train from hell. I stood up and tried my best to see where this noise was coming from. There was the tree line about two-tenths of a mile down the mountain from me that I could pinpoint the noise coming from. I squinted hard and raised a hand to my brow. I saw a large shadow standing at the very edge, the same size as the animal from the night before. My eyes hadn't deceived me. This thing was at least ten feet tall. The demonic sound abruptly stopped, its echoes flying throughout the hollows around. Stretching outward from the huge shadow, I could see what appeared to be two arms, as thick as oak trunks, grabbing on to a couple of nearby trees on its right and left. I held my breath, my eyes unbelieving, and my mind scrambling to make thought. The creature began to violently shake the fully grown trees at its sides like they were pom-poms. At the same time, the choral noise of the damned started up again, blasting up the mountain like devil trumpets. It was the most unsettling noise I had ever heard. Details were still shadowed. However, to my shock, Two glowing orbs formed where the beast's eyes would be. Beaming, boiling red eyes. My bones became ice, and all the breath escaped from my tense chest. This monstrous creature continued to thrash the trees around and bellow from the forest edge. I had to do something. I had a little bit of distance on it and the high ground. It also seemed to like staying in the shadows. Otherwise, I saw no reason why it wasn't already chasing me. It knew exactly where I was, so there was no use in trying to hide. I also knew a predator like this would simply wait for night to fall and then come take me if I stayed where I was. I had to act. I took off in a dead sprint back toward the cabin. Carefully staying on trail, I glanced to my left down the mountain. The creature was on the move toward me through the trees, running on all fours like a Kodiak. I cursed and screamed. I focused back on the trail, knowing speed was everything to me. I began down the mountain back toward a hollow. I needed to find a way to beat this thing to the cabin and get in my car and get the hell out of here. I looked quickly back at my pursuant. It was gaining on me. It must have been moving at least 30, 35 miles an hour. I screamed as I turned again to the trail in front of me. I came off the cleared mountain trail and back into the dense forest, running full speed, dodging anything that could trip me up and doom me. I had to do something, quick. I suddenly came across a fork in the trail that I didn't remember seeing on the way up. I must have come from my left, I thought, as I originally took the trail to my right coming from the cabin. Perhaps this new trail to my right led back to the cabin the other way. It also appeared to move back up to the mountainside, which could give me more clearing and more precious waning sunlight. I darted right at the fork and redirected uphill. Another ominous blast from the beast shot through the air. It saw my change of direction for sure. I didn't have the courage or the time to look back and see how close it was getting, but that roar was way louder than it was before. I laser-focused ahead on the trail, 
my body completely entering survival mode. The adrenaline was crazy. I could run like this forever, even uphill. I saw a clearing ahead that I figured to be the opposite side of the mountaintop that I was just on. I broke through the tree line and slowed my pace slightly, getting a good look at the trail and my surroundings. My heart dropped. The trail didn't continue back down. After about a hundred feet of clearing, the path led straight to the mouth of a small cave, entering into a short bluff in the mountainside. I turned around and my entire body went stiff. There was the creature in full detail, standing on two legs at the tree line, the closest I had seen it. Standing about 12 feet tall, it had the body type of a bear with longer, more human-like arms and legs. Its arms were fully outstretched, as if it knew it was closely presenting itself to me for the first time. Its paws were adorned with foot-long pale claws, as big around as steak knives. It was covered in thick, dark hair. The most striking feature, however, was its head. It was similar to a grizzly's head, except as tall and wide as an air conditioning unit. Also, instead of ears and nose, three short black horns sprang up from its skull, forming a triangle. Its jaws opened and seemed to dislocate, dropping unnaturally wide and revealing two rows of disgustingly orange, railroad spike-sized teeth. It had remained silent and still there at the forest edge as I watched in horror. Then, the thing's face was suddenly blazed by two hellish, red, volleyball-sized eyes. Right after this lighting, I learned where all the whistle noises were coming from. Arms still outstretched and towering at the tree line, the beast puffed out its chest and took a deep, rotten breath. Suddenly, from all over its torso, holes opened up. Ghastly orifices. There must have been at least a dozen in all shapes and sizes. On the bigger ones, I could see a short, sharp circle of teeth. They were mouths. The beast let out the huge breath, and all the mouths roared together. That berating, dissonant, evil, and ear-shattering chord. I didn't have time to take it all in. Still in an instinctual flight, I turned and ran across the remainder of the clearing and into the mouth of the cave. I had to take the chance. Perhaps the creature can't fit in this place. I couldn't just stay out in the open with that monster waiting nearby. I entered the opening as the dreadful noise continued to shoot over the clearing and rang through the stone tube. I paused for a moment, getting my phone out and turning on my flashlight. I shined it down the dark passageway I found myself in. To my surprise, it wasn't so much a natural cave as it was a tunnel. It stretched far past the extent of my beams, impossibly dark beyond. In a swift walk, I carefully made my way through and what seemed to be downward into the mountain. Nothing changed geologically for several minutes as I continued on using my slowly dying phone's light. In the back of my mind, I knew I had to find a way out. Soon, or I was doomed, regardless of my predator's success. My quick walk came to a halt as I suddenly was thrust out of the smaller tunnel and into a huge room within the mountain. As I stopped, I shone my light around, unable to see the dimensions of this huge cavern. Walking about 100 feet toward the center, I came upon a huge column, as wide and tall as a four-story townhouse. Finally, having my bearings on the size of the huge cavity, I walked around the gigantic stone support with my light. It was covered in some kind of artwork. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be decorated in seemingly ancient drawings of all sorts of age-faded colors. I backed up so I could get a fuller view of the prehistoric paintings. Soaring up at least 20 feet 
a macabre mural revealed itself. It depicted a large mountain with several supposed human beings standing on top. They were holding spears and swords and were leading a tied prisoner toward the mountain's edge. The sun was shown large and orange above them, but about a quarter down the mountain, the sunlight stopped throwing the etchings of a green forest below into surrounding graphite-scratched darkness. At the base of the mountain was the likeness of the monster itself. It was depicted as being about as half as big as the mountain, its arms out wide, holding on to two humans with its long claws piercing their bloody skin. Its head was facing upward, eyes red, and mouth ferociously agape, placed under where the humans up top were leading their prisoner. It was the scene of a sacrifice. The humans were throwing prisoners off the mountain and into the dark maw of the beast. The drawings must have been thousands of years old. I held a hand to my mouth as I took it all in and backed away. Whatever this thing was, it had been in these mountains for millennia, if not longer. An immortal and indestructible evil. My silent puzzling of the artwork was cut short by the all-too-familiar, devastating howl of the beast throughout the large cavern. It wasn't in there with me yet, but it was growing close, wherever it was. Shining my light around, I could see tunnels of all sizes shooting out into the mountain. The terrible noise seemed to be coming through the largest opening, big enough to drive a bus through. I sprinted over across the natural room and into the smallest tunnel I could find that I could still fit through. I was off in the fastest run I could muster, while also carefully navigating the slender pathway. Another loud blast behind me let me know the creature had made its way into the large cavern where I was just moments before. My pathway began to lead uphill. This was a good sign as perhaps I was going to be coming out of the mountain soon. Suddenly, the walls of my tunnel began to vibrate and dust began to fall from the ceiling. Oh no, there's no way the thing could fit in here, right? No, the shaking was in short bursts rocking the entire earth with each forceful blow. It was trying to collapse the cave and bury me. I was in a full upward sprint, phone light in hand, as each hit and roar from the monster behind me almost knocked me down. Small rocks began to fall from the top of the cave. My time was almost out. One of the falling rocks hit my hand, knocking my phone out. I didn't have the time to pick it up, so I screamed and pressed on blindly with arms jutting out ahead of me. Just when hope was about lost, I finally saw a small light up ahead. I ran as hard as I ever could as the monster's plan was almost complete. Larger and larger rocks falling to the floor behind me and the foundation of the tunnel cracking. Shockingly, the underground path ended in a wall with a metal ladder built in, leading up toward the source of the light. I grabbed on and climbed with no regard of my hands or feet, moving as quickly as possible, as finally the entire tunnel below me collapsed. Clouds of dust rushed upward past me, filling my lungs and causing me to retch. I kept climbing, seeing an opening ahead into the light. At long last, I came to the ladder's end and threw myself out of the hole entirely. As I cleared dust from my eyes, I saw that I was in a room, a basement, in fact, with a single dirty window offering the low lights of sunset from outside. I sat in utter shock as I caught my injured breath and had a look around. Relief took over me although it would take years to fully comprehend what I had just experienced. My terror was soon refreshed, though, as I stood up and got a look of the basement. It was built up with cinder block walls, 
and there was a wooden staircase leading up to a door, deadbolt locked and fastened with rusted chains. What was this place? Two large metal poles held up the ceiling from the center of the room. I looked around and saw in one corner a wooden table covered with several pairs of handcuffs, rope, and two long rusted knives. Overlooking the table was a wall full of photographs. I walked over to get a closer look. My mouth fell open in absolute horror. They were missing persons posters. There had to be at least 50 hanging. Ranging in ages from young children to grandparents, the photographed faces on the posters seemed to cover decades of reporting. Studying the dates of the prints, I saw flyers from as early as the 1960s. Something very, very bad had been happening here. It was time to leave. As I made my way over to the staircase to attempt a breakout through the locked door, I heard an upstairs door open and footsteps slowly traversing above me. I froze. The heavy footsteps slowly seemed to be covering the room right above me, almost in a circle. Thinking as fast as I could, I went back to the table and grabbed some rope. I wrapped some around my right hand and formed a fist. I walked over to the single dusty window and looked for any way to open it. It would only be barely big enough to fit through, even if I do find a way to break it. The footsteps above me were nearing the area by the basement door. My time was very short. In three adrenaline-fueled bursts, I punched out the glass window. Immediately, I heard keys jingling and the locks of the basement door being turned. My knuckles were bleeding bad in spite of the rope covering. There were long, stray shards of glass remaining in the window pane. Luckily, the bottom of it was mostly clear, so I quickly hoisted myself up, disregarding my hands and back as they got carved up by the razor-sharp remnants. Halfway out the window, I heard the basement door being flung open and footsteps racing down the stairs. I forced the rest of my body out of the small window sending waves of sharp pain through my legs as they grated the glass. I stood up, feeling grass in my injured hands, and took off in a sprint. After a moment of horror and confusion, I realized exactly where I was. I was at the third vacant house right next to the cabin I had rented, across from Mrs. Klein's. I sprinted about a quarter mile downhill and onto the gravel road. By the grace of God, my car keys were still in my pocket. So I raced back over to my cabin and hopped in and cranked it. I backed out of the driveway, giving my cabin one last dastardly look before twisting my car around and accelerating. I, of course, glanced over at the home of Mrs. Klein, still boarded up save for the busted-in front door. There was yellow tape everywhere. I glanced to my left, and my spirit fell. A huge pickup truck was barreling down the driveway of the vacant house toward the road. I slammed my gas pedal and took off as fast as I possibly could. I had at least half a mile on the truck by the time it romped onto the gravel road from the driveway. It had a lot more power than my car, however, and was gaining ground fast behind me. I knew I was still about a mile from the highway, so I had to keep pushing it hard. As the truck began cutting the distance between us, I glanced in the rear view mirror and could see the forms of two men in the front seats. I looked forward and persisted in my escape, slamming my foot down as hard as I could with no regard for the well-being of my car. Ahead. I could finally see the end of gravel and the beginning of further hope. I knew I'd still have to make it to town, but flagging down a passing car would be a lot easier on the highway, at least giving me another layer of a chance. I came up on the asphalt at high speed and jacked it hard, 
fishtailing me across both lanes of traffic L before I could make a wobbly path to the right side of the yellow paint. I once again slammed hard on the gas as I glanced in the mirror again with bated breath. To my amazement, the truck had hit its brakes hard and was sitting still at the edge of the gravel road, engulfed in a large cloud of dust. Giving little of my disturbed mind as to question why the truck had halted short of the highway, I sped on. My elbows were locked straight and my right leg was flexed on the gas. I didn't even blink as I eventually made my way back through Coldwater Springs. All I could do was drive on. My brain and body were shattered. All I knew is that I was free. 